If like me, you enjoy getting into the surf, letting the waves wash over you, maybe even do some boogie boarding or surfing, then you'll know how valuable it is to have a really good wetsuit, especially if it's cold. And here in the UK, believe me, the water gets cold, really cold. When you're constantly going in and out of the water, you need something that's flexible and will shed water as quickly as possible when you're out of the water, but also something that will help you keep warm when you're in the water. It's a lot to ask, but this was the challenge a group of students from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology in the United States of America were set when in 2015, they visited a wetsuit manufacturer in Taiwan. And that's not all. They were asked to find a sustainable bio-inspired solution for wetsuits, a solution inspired by the natural world. And they did. Hey there, welcome back to 30 Animals That Made Us Smarter, an original podcast from the BBC World Service. The podcast about how animals are helping us to solve some really challenging problems. We've heard some fascinating stories so far. One of my favourites was number six, how tardigrades, an animal you might never have heard of, let alone seen, because they are tiny, could hold the key in helping us to transport vaccines across the globe. So make sure you hit that subscribe button and you'll get every podcast automatically. In this number 12, sea otters in wetsuits, we'll be discovering how sea otters, which are probably one of the most adorable creatures out there, have inspired a wetsuit design that is both waterproof and warm. After returning from her trip to Taiwan, Professor Annette Peko Hosoi asked one of her students, Alice Nasto, to find examples in the natural world that could serve as a design model for warm, dry, streamlined wetsuits. Scouring the literature, Nasto found herself focusing on semi-aquatic mammals like beavers and sea otters. Now, here's a cool fact for you. Sea otters are famed for having the finest fur in the entire animal kingdom. Not only is it beautiful, but it's also incredibly dense, with something like 150,000 hairs per square centimetre. By comparison, Eurasian otters have about half this amount, with roughly 80,000 hairs per square centimetre. And yet we only have about 100,000 hairs on our entire head. So, why are sea otters so furry? Well, they spend a lot of their time in waters along the coasts of the northern and eastern North Pacific Ocean, where they raise their young and search for food, which includes crabs, clams, sea urchins, and slow-moving fish. The only problem is that these waters can be very cold. When we look at other aquatic mammals like walruses and whales, they get around this by building up a thick layer of blubber, which helps insulate them when they're swimming and diving out at sea. But sea otters don't have this luxury. Instead, they rely on their fur to keep them warm. Because their fur is so dense, it traps pockets of air in between the layers, keeping these aquatic animals not only warm, but dry. But all that hair needs the utmost of care. So when sea otters aren't eating or sleeping, they're grooming. And they groom themselves a lot. Cleaning the fur, squeezing out water and blowing air into the fur all serves to keep the fur in top condition and the otters as warm as possible. There are just a few places on a sea otter's body that doesn't have such dense fur. And that includes their paws. This is one reason why they hold their paws out of the water when resting. It's an easy way to conserve body heat. Ironically, however, the thing that makes it possible for otters to thrive in such chilly waters, their fur, is also what brought them to the brink of extinction. In 1745, fur traders from Siberia made their way eastward along the Aleutian Island chain over to Alaska's Pacific coast. They were on the hunt for otter pelts for the Asian fur market. At times, they were ruthless in their quest, 
even forcing Alaskan natives to harvest the mammals. But in many cases, the native hunters were somewhat willing trade partners. The result was near catastrophic. A species that once numbered 300,000 and spread from the Baja Peninsula to the Sea of Japan had by 1899 dwindled to just a few thousand otters in Alaska and a few dozen in California. The rest had been wiped out. Something clearly had to be done. And in July 1911, the United States, Japan, Russia and Great Britain entered into a treaty for the protection of fur seals and sea otters in the North Pacific by outlawing the killing of fur seals and sea otters in these waters by any American except Alaskan natives. The United States Navy was even charged with enforcing the treaty in the hope of seeing sea otter numbers increase. And that's exactly what happened. Sea otters in Alaska made a remarkable recovery. Today, it's estimated that 150,000 of them are living in Alaskan waters alone. Now, otter fur has two special properties that make it especially good at creating an insulating layer of air. We already know that it's extremely dense, about a thousand times denser than human hair, but it's also spiky. It wouldn't do them any good if it were smooth and perfectly combed. Instead, otters want their hair to be as tangled as possible to trap the maximum number of air bubbles. This is where the spiky aspect comes in handy. Otter pelts may feel soft and smooth to us, but if you look at otter hair under a microscope, you'll see that it's covered in tiny geometric barbs. These barbs help the hair mat together so tightly that the fur near the otter's body is almost completely dry. And keeping the animals dry is the key to keeping them warm. Through her research, Alice Nasto also learned that sea otters are covered in two different types of fur. There are the outer guard hairs, which are long, thin, and act like a defensive shield for the shorter, denser underfur. Biologists thought that the guard hairs kept water from penetrating the underfur, thereby trapping warm air against the animal's skin. But how this happened wasn't fully understood. This is where Nasto got busy. Her aim was to mimic the properties of the otter pelt in a wetsuit. She began by making precise fur-like surfaces of various dimensions and plunging these surfaces into liquid at varying speeds. To see how effective the different designs were, she used video imaging to measure how much air was trapped in the fur during each soaking. To make these hairy surfaces, Nasto created several molds by laser cutting thousands of tiny holes in small acrylic blocks. The size and spacing of the individual holes was different in each mold. She then filled the molds with a soft casting rubber called PDMS or polydimethylsiloxane. Then after they'd set, she pulled the artificial pelts out of the mold. Each of the hairy surfaces was then mounted onto a vertical motorized stage with the hairs facing outward and then submerged into silicon oil. She chose silicon oil rather than water as this makes it easier to see any air pockets forming. As each of the hairy surfaces was lowered, she saw how a clear boundary layer developed between the liquid and the air in the hairs with the air forming a thicker layer in the hairs closer to the surface and progressively thinning out with depth. Her tests showed that surfaces with denser fur that were plunged at higher speeds generally retained a thicker layer of air within their hairs. So both the spacing of individual hairs and the speed at which they were plunged seemed to be important factors when it came to working out how much air a surface could trap. Together, Hosoi and her colleagues went on to develop a simple model to describe this air trapping effect in precise mathematical terms. Hosoi and Nasto applied their equation to the experimental data and found their predictions matched the data precisely. 
The team can now accurately predict how thick an air layer will surround a hairy surface based on their equation. As Professor Hossoy explains, people have known that these animals use their fur to trap air, but for a given piece of fur, they couldn't have answered the question, is this going to trap air or not? But now, given a particular hair density, length and diving speed, the team know which designs will trap air and which will not. And with this information, the next step is to design a new type of wetsuit. Hossoy points out, you could make a very hairy wetsuit that looks like a furry monster suit that would trap a lot of air, but that's probably not the best way to go about it. So, whilst there's still more development to do, it may not be long before we're taking to the waves in rather chic little furry pelts to keep us both dry and warm. And we'll have the sea otter to thank. Now, word got around. José Bico is an associate professor at the City of Paris Industrial Physics and Chemistry Higher Education Institution in France. He thinks that the team's work may have other applications, for example, in the process of industrial dip coating. This is where surfaces are dipped in chemicals to achieve an even protective coating. One of the challenges when it comes to industrial coatings is air or liquid entrapment. Very often, treatments involve dipping an object in a liquid bath. What you don't want is any air getting trapped. What he likes about the model that the team have developed is that it tells you how fast you can dip before you're likely to trap air, so that you can operate at maximum efficiency without compromising the product. This would be especially useful when you want to coat something like a structure involving cooling fins, which has a complex shape. There's something really beautiful about this, isn't there? That you can prevent bubbles from forming by controlling the speed of the dipping. I suspect it may well lend itself to other applications as well. Meanwhile, the sea otters carry on eating and sleeping and grooming and staying warm. Like what you heard so far? Head over to our website now bbcworldservice.com slash 30 animals where you'll find more information about this story. In Stenokara Beetle and Water Collector, number 13 of 30 animals that made us smarter, an original podcast from the BBC World Service, we'll be hearing how a head-standing beetle in the Namib Desert is teaching us how to extract water from thin air. Thanks for listening. <laughs>